So years ago, actually, I should know which year, but I don't. Um, I was, sh- was sharing the stage with, uh, I was the moderator, with uh, the writers Jonathan Franzen and John Irving and Azar Nafisi. And in that company, in an American setting, Azar Nafisi is probably the less famous writer. But she was the one who really grabbed all of us, including, I think, the other two writers. I watched a clip of it this morning. Uh, she has everybody laughing. She has at least one of those two writers kind of writhing in embarrassment, but in a good way. Uh, She's a great listener, a great reader, a great writer. She's stayed with us in the sense of visiting the show from time to time, especially when people were worried uh, about developments in America. And she's back today to talk about her new book. There's just no way you're not going to like Azar Nafisi. I I think she just kind of doesn't let that happen. Okay, that's, well, I, do I have to say that's Nina Simone? Does everybody in the world not know that? Uh, but maybe just the right uh, song to begin our conversation today with Azar Nafisi, whose new book is Read Dangerously, The Subversive Power of Literature in Troubled Times. I'm also doing something very manipulative here, which any good interviewer does. Every interviewer is manipulative. I happen to know she loves Nina Simone. So this is a way, this is a way of kind of waking up a whole bunch of neurons in her that maybe she wasn't even planning to use today. So Azar Nafisi, um, I feel like I know you. I've talked to you quite a few times at this point. I've shared a stage with you and, and Jonathan Franson and John Irving with me as the moderator. Uh, so it's, it's great to be talking to you again. It's great talking to you too. I remember um, those conversations and it's a pleasure to be here again. Right. We may, we may circle back to them. You know, I mean, the other reason for playing Nina Simone right there uh, is, is the sentiment that's in that song, right? I mean, there's that. And, and it's there. It's interesting how the word feel uh, is, mm-hmm. is, is there in two of her most famous songs, Birds in the Sky, You Know How I Feel, uh, and then yeah. and, and wish, uh, wish I Knew How It Feels to Be Free. I mean, that's very much the, there in this book, this, uh, this series of letters to your father uh, about art, about creation, about imagination, about the power of books. It is that notion of, of knowing how somebody else feels or wondering how something would feel? Exactly. Uh, feeling, I mean, writing is, should come from the heart. And, uh, uh, you know, when, when you were talking about um, uh, the song and the, the whole issue around feeling, um, I sort of uh, remembered uh, Henry James during World War I that he opposed uh, uh, with his heart and soul. Uh, in order to resist, he wrote a friend, feel, feel all you can. And uh, that is how I feel right now about the war in Ukraine, that we should not forget. And the only way we uh, prevent ourselves from forgetting is to uh, feel, Yes. uh, to feel with the people uh, in Ukraine, to feel with the Russian soldiers as well, actually. Yes. Okay. you know, we're sort of getting way ahead of my plan here. But but since we're there, 
right now. Let's just stay there for a second. I want to circle back to your these these letters, to your father, to all of that. But since you kind of just went there, um, yeah, let's uh, – Kat, can we just play O2? This is going to be uh, uh, President uh, Vladimir Zelensky. He's actually speaking uh, at, at the Grammy Award Ceremony, which is something that mm-hmm. a lot of world leaders wouldn't have thought to do. Uh, here's a little bit of what he had to say. The world doesn't let us choose who survives and who stays in internal silence. Our musicians wear body armor. Instead of tuxedo, they sing to the wounded in hospitals, even to those who can't hear them, but the music will break through. Anyway, we defend our freedom to live, to love, to sound. On our land, we are fighting Russia, which brings horrible silence with its bombs, the dead silence. Feel the silence with your music. Feel it today to tell our story. Tell the truth about the war on your social networks, on TV, support us in any way you can, any but not silence. And then peace will come. Well, just react to that. My God, <laughs> I uh, I know that I'm on radio, but uh, somehow I feel dumbfounded, you know, mm-hmm. uh, how to react. Uh, yes, they have to tell their story. And uh, every day, uh, uh, even on the news, uh, we get the we get the story. And uh, uh, I, one of the things that I remember well uh, from the images of the war is this um, girl alone sitting on a chair amidst the ruins uh, in a public square, I guess, and playing her cello. Uh, you know, uh, to bring life to, uh, while surrounded by death, to bring life to us, to remind us that um, we live and music lives and music has been here before us and it will be here after us. I think also what I think when I see him, when I see him do something like that, too, is he came to us from the world of imagination in, in a way that's fairly rare in the world of of world leader, of global leadership. I mean, you've got your Vaclav Havel yeah. once in a while. But here's this guy. He was a comedian, but he was a creator of fiction, mostly fiction on television. And, and I feel that he has weaponized that. Uh, I think he's weaponized his imagination, his ability to create affinity, to use imagery that really touches us. I mean, you know, how do you not well up with tears when he says our musicians wear body armor, armor instead of tuxedos, they sing to the wounded in hospitals? There aren't a lot of world leaders who would be able to put it that way. And I think it's because he comes from, quote unquote, our world, the world of imagination and empathy. Exactly. Exactly. It is because of that. Uh, uh, You know, uh, Saul Bellow uh, used to say that the danger, the threat to the West uh, is its atrophy of feeling and um, sleeping consciousness. And a lot of our leaders today are suffering from atrophy of feeling and sleeping consciousness. But uh, Zelensky awakens in us um, all the experiences that um, we had forgotten about. It awakens our, he awakens our senses. We experience his words. We don't just listen to them. And uh, that is a very rare gift and uh, imagination definitely is needed um, uh, in times, extreme times, uh, like the one that we're living in right now. Right. When you give me that Bellow quote, I think also of D.H. Lawrence, uh, who, who wrote, the essential American soul is hard, isolate, stoic, and a killer. It has never yet melted. Uh, he's writing that in 1923, but in a way, uh, the, the, the existential challenge to Americans is to prove him wrong. Um, and, and sometimes we do, but I think more often we don't for some of the reasons that Bellow talks about there. Yeah, there's this sort of utilitarian mindset uh, about um, imagination and ideas uh, that of what use are they to us, you know? Uh, I mean, imagine. <laughs> Imagination uh, does not make policies, but it certainly helps shape the mind of policymakers. I mean, by its existence, uh, it negates certain things. Uh, uh, It negates cruelty. It negates lack of empathy. 
uh, and that is the most pragmatic thing you can find, you know. Yes. I, you know, another thought that I have about that, too, is there's another part of the American consciousness, um, and, and maybe it's more universal than that. I, I don't really know, that will scold us for whimsy, for, for, for imagination, for dwelling in something that's not true, for turning our attention to a fictive world, even a fictive world that's maybe, uh, yeah, a little bit frivolous, a little bit shallow. And I always think, well, isn't the job of struggle, isn't the work of struggle, isn't the work uh, of somebody like Zelensky right now to restore us to a time when maybe we can concentrate on things that are just merely delightful or, you know, Ruskin says the most beautiful things in the world are useless, uh, peacocks and lilies, for example. I think that's his, yeah. uh, th- that's the quote. That And, you know, I <laughs> whenever I hear Zelensky being amazing, I also think there's a clip, there's a couple of clips like this. When he was a comedian, he did this thing a couple of times in award ceremonies, and, and apologies for the graphic nature of it, but he and a confederate would come out on stage and their waists would be blocked by a piano, and, and they would oh. drop their pants and put their arms in the air, and they would pretend to play chopsticks with their penises, basically, um, which is way funnier than when you see it than it is when I describe it. But I think he part of what he wants to do is get back to that world where you could do something like that. You could make other people laugh with some kind of idiotic thing. You, you I think, write about it in the book when you talk about how in, in, I think it's in the Atwood letter, you talk about one of the things totalitarianism tries to take away from you uh, is what your normal life was like, you know, and if you're living in the Islamic yeah. Republic, maybe, yeah, I think you as acts of defiance would let a little hair s- sneak out among <laughs> from under the, the hair covering or put on a little bit of makeup in defiance of the rules because it's frivolous, but it's normal and normal is precious. But I'll stop babbling and you comment. Yeah, I know. Uh, I I agree with you wholeheartedly. You know, uh, I was thinking about um, uh, how often I say I have to thank the Islamic Republic for reminding me about the joy of the feel of the wind in my hair. Mm-hmm. Uh, or the joy of just being free, just just walking down the streets and licking an ice cream uh, ice cream cone, you know. Um, these little details, these whimsical uh, details, are what um, uh, are our answer, our response to the fickleness of life and absoluteness of death. Uh, we challenge life. We tease it. Uh, by um, becoming that carefree as dropping our pants, you know. <laughs> uh, so, and, and, and you need it. Mm-hmm. You need it. Uh, and uh, and uh, you, the same way that you need the beauty of the peacock, um, it makes you uh, go back, return to life and appreciate life just on an everyday basis. So oh, there, I want. there's a place I want to go. I want to, first of all, remind everybody, I'm talking to Azar Nafisi. I think she and I have a bad con- uh, habit of starting our conversations in the middle, uh, which is what we're doing right now, uh, <laughs> and without setting the stage at all. Her book is Read Dangerously, The Subversive Power of Literature in Troubled Times. It has an, I can never pronounce this word, epistolary uh, format. Uh, it consists of letters to her uh, her father, uh, who is no longer, no longer here on earth, uh, about uh, about writing and writers and the ways in which writing interacts w- with politics. But you know, just to what you were saying before, I'm actually uh, going to take the odd step of courting you back to you. So um, in November of 2016, when Donald Trump was elected, uh, we were all just shocked. And somehow or other, it occurred to me that you would be a good guest to have on the air the next day, the day after the election. And so you appeared on that show. And so this is a uh, cat. This is a uh, one. Uh, here's what you have to say. And the fact that we allow, for example, Mr. Trump to occupy all our waking hours, <laughs> <laughs> that in itself, even if we are thinking about him negatively and talking about him negatively, that in itself means that he has won uh, because uh, he now has control of our mind. We don't define ourselves. And what I learned in Iran was that the best way to resist um, any form of oppression to become more yourself, you know, to be able to define who you are and what you want and not constantly fall into the trap of being for or against and letting them define who you are. 
I can't tell you how many times I quoted that to people over the next four years. It, it really was that it was the day after the election, and it really was absolutely the right way to think about that. And and I know you continue to feel that right way, right? Be be yourself. It's the best revenge. I I do continue to feel that way. This is how women resisted the Islamic Republic, because, you know, what a totalitarian mindset does, it wants to impose its own voice and its own ideas, its own images upon the whole population. So uniformly, the population become the voice of the totalitarian. And under circumstances, your individuality, your identity, your sense of uh, integrity as an individual, it is all um, in danger. And that is why you need to become more yourself. I always tell people that my struggle against the Islamic Republic was never just political. It was existential. It was my attempt as a woman as a writer, as a reader, as a mother, as a friend, and as a believer in human rights to not lose my integrity, to be who I am rather than to become a figment of their imagination the way they wanted me to become. You know, reading the new book, uh, I thought about that whole thing all over again. And at the end of your introduction, there's a quote from Toni Morrison who says, art takes us and makes us take a journey beyond price, beyond cost, into bearing witness to the world as it is and as it should be. Um, And I do feel, and I don't want to make this a conversation about Trump any more than we have to, but but when I think of Trump, and this may also be true of Putin, I just don't know enough about him to know whether it's true. But Trump is clearly a person who has no relationship to art of any kind. I mean, he really is, and this is borne out by people who really kind of chronicled him. He has no relation to art and has therefore no ability to participate in the world of imagination, to join uh, a, a creator and the rest of us, the consumers of that creation, in some kind of different view of the world, the world either as it is or as it should be, uh, to to quote Morrison. And I feel like as a result, he He has no other alternative except to try to convert the world into his own dream, whatever it is that he's dreaming about, whatever it is that he he thinks is happening, who he thinks he is, what his role is. He, he doesn't have anything else on his menu besides that, I think partly because of his his starvation from art. That is. Yeah. Yeah, that that is the truth. And instead of imagination, he has replaced imagination with lies. I mean, creating illusions, fabricating. He has his, both his life and the life of his mind, whatever that is, uh, uh, are fabrications. Uh, And therefore, uh, he cannot relate to the world. That is why he cannot empathize. You notice how careless he is when in relationship with others. So how without a heart, literally, he is. And that is because he has shunned that world of imagination where you become curious about other people. It is fear of others. It is fear that they will come and change you and you will be who you are anymore. So... So many places I want to go here, but one of the one of the figures who appears in in one of the letters in your book is Plato, um, and uh, one of the things that he writes about is essentially our fear of thinking, of contemplating, uh, of challenging our own notion of reality. I think you cite an exchange between Socrates and Glaucon where uh, I think Socrates says, what if there's a man who can lead everybody up out of their chains, out of this world of shadows uh, to see the light of truth? Uh, What if he could do that? Uh, Will they kill him? (laughs) I think Glaucon Glaucon says, they surely will kill him. Um, So what does that mean to you? What, what, What are they talking about? Well, I have been thinking about this a lot, both when I was living in Iran under the Islamic Republic and when I came back to um, America. The fact that uh, our tendency um, to become so complacent, we don't want to be disturbed. And as James Baldwin said, artists are here to disturb the peace. 
great literature is always disturbing our peace because we are much more comfortable if we don't have those paradoxes and ambiguities and opaqueness that real life has and that real literature brings back to us. Uh, so we want to be, you notice, Colin, how many times a day um, people uh, express the fact that I'm not comfortable for, with that. Well, bloody hell, you shouldn't be comfortable all the time. There should be things that disturb you. There should be things that make you question not just the world, but yourself. And that questioning of the self is what we are most afraid of. Oh, yes. That questioning of the self. You know, you know an imagination makes us, imagination makes us, it becomes a mirror in which we look at ourselves. And a lot of times we don't like what we see. The, oh, that's, I mean, when you say that, I think of an experience that we had here on the show where we took the show uh, up to, I think, Lenox, Massachusetts, where there's a very famous Shakespeare company up there run by this, run at the time by this director, Tina Packer. And we were up there. She had done this amazing production of The Merchant of Venice. And and so mm -hmm. I, I went on, a, 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 on an evening and sitting behind me at this uh, were two women who I think were pretty clearly Jewish and they were... Well, they were not having it. You know, they were really, really disturbed. They were incredibly uncomfortable with what what was on stage and what was being said on stage and the way Shylock was treated and, and talked about and, and was really bothering them a lot. So a day or two later, we did a show with Tina Packer and with this actor, Jonathan Epstein, who had played Shylock there. And I told that story of the woman and I asked Jonathan Epstein what he thought about that. And he said, well, yes, so they were not having it. Good. They shouldn't be having it. You know, that's yes. the that's the point. <laughs> that's the point that, of doing this is, show. That is exactly how I feel when someone tells me that they are disturbed by um, uh, reading Lolita or reading reading Huckleberry Finn, because you know Twain says, "Don't say the lady screamed. Bring her on stage and make her scream." The whole idea is that we need fiction like that to make us really hate and not be able to tolerate, not be able to tolerate the rape of a 12 year old girl, not to be able to tolerate um, uh, a father like Jim uh, having her children sold down the river. This is the whole point of literature. It is disturbing and it is disturbing because life is disturbing. If we don't allow our students through fiction to discover the disturbing aspects of life, how do we protect them against the disturbing realities that whether they want it or not, whether you are there or not, they are going to experience it. I mean, look at the situation right now that we live in. How much control do we have over these things? So we should come prepared and stories are there to prepare us. So, um, you know, we you write a lot in the book about poets and about writers. And of course, Plato thought that poets were unruly and not even from Plato's point of view, necessarily in a helpful way to a republic, uh, although I think we all agree, no, they're very, very helpful for all the reasons that we're saying right now. I would add, though, to the list, particularly these days, comedians. Once again, Zelensky, a comedian, but yeah. somebody that I, haven't, yeah. I particularly have in mind, and he's very controversial, I know, uh, is Dave Chappelle. Uh, here's a little uh, bit of him yeah. from his uh, special, The Bird Revelation. Everybody gets mad because I say these jokes, but you understand that this is, the best time to say them, more now than ever. And I know there's some comedians in the back, mother you have a responsibility to speak recklessly. Otherwise, my kids may never know what reckless talk sounds like, the joys of being wrong. I didn't come here to be right. Just came here to around. So it's, he's taking a page from your book right there, I feel. Well, yes. Uh... I was thinking, uh, I don't know why, uh, listening to him, I was just reminded of children's stories mm -hmm. and how disturbing they are. 
you know, for example, Hansel and Gretel, uh, her step, their step parents, uh, stepmother and father, um, take him, uh, leave them in the forest. And who do they meet in the forest? A witch who wants to kill them and eat them. You know, <laughs> yes. these are children's stories, uh, biting into the poison apple. Um, all of them show you the experiences that you might have in real life. They prepare you for life. And to take away that and to take away the sense of humor, which is a way of resisting oppression. It is a way of resisting the absurdity of this life we live. You know, to take that humor away because you are disturbed uh, is a great disservice. Uh, I could use stronger words, but I uh, <laughs> just uh, say that it is a great disservice. All right. We absolutely must stop here and take a break. We will come back. You will have more Azar Nafisi, I promise. Sit there. lot of women who are attracted to you in this condition. Really? I didn't think there was any condition that they'd uh, be attracted to You are to a me. dangerous man. There are very beautiful women who like that. Really? Yeah. Even with me, they would like it? It's not exactly you. It's the fatwa wrapped around you like kind of sexy pixie dust. Huh. But you have to stop acting like a wuss. I mean, look at you. You look like a person trying to hide. That's exactly right. That is not sexy. Be a man, stop this, and fatwa sex will follow. Fatwa sex? The best sex there is. Wow. Yes. What about the fatwa itself? I don't, you know, you've survived many, many years now. Well, it's, you know, it's there. Yeah? But f*** it. All right, that is, believe it, <laughs> believe it or not, the actual... Actually, if you've ever met Salman Rushdie, you have no trouble believing that that's the real Salman Rushdie, but it really is him, too. Uh, on Curb Your Enthusiasm, I'm talking to Larry David. Uh, we're talking to Azar Nafisi. Uh, her book is Read Dangerously, The Subversive Power of Literature in Troubled Times. This is a, a series of uh, letters that she has written kind of apostrophically uh, to her father, uh, who we've got to talk about in, in this segment. But um, but first of all, Lazar, there's an interesting parallelism, I think, between your father um, and Rushdie. They are both people who, um, well, who won't apologize when, in fact, people are demanding that they apologize and when some kind of attempt to be conciliatory might have saved them an awful lot of trouble. Uh, and it's just something that they have no interest in doing. Yes, I think my father felt that if he apologized, he would be ashamed of himself. I mean, we, no matter what kind of a face we put to the world, uh, uh, we know when we're not doing the right thing. And apology was not the right thing to do. And um, uh, he paid the price for it. But um, I think that his opponents were the ones who really failed rather than him in the end. He was exonerated of all the charges. And uh, in his defense, uh, he uh, brought up all the points that he wanted to address. And uh, so, uh, yes, um, you have to be prepared to pay the price. Right. I mean, we should say your father, the mayor of Tehran, was jailed for four years uh, under those circumstances. Um, and, and reading this book, uh, all of these letters are addressed to your father. You address him as Baba. Um, it's, it's also just a process of kind of falling in love with your father. There's so many things that I wind up liking about him, including 
um, there's an exchange, and I, I'm, I can't exactly remember which particular condition in Iran or perhaps the U.S., but I think it's in Iran, that is being talked about, but it's being talked about in his presence. And, and he does something that I, I'm so grateful for him to do, which is to say, I mean, the, the phrase that I use is the narcissism of the present catastrophe. There's a sense, whatever we're living through at any given moment, we have a sense of saying, this is the worst thing ever. This is the worst thing yeah. anything's ever been, any, anybody's ever been through. Uh, and I always think, well, geez, no, I've been alive 67 years from now. Well, now and I, like Trump was really bad. I could make an argument that there were worse periods in my lifetime of American history. Uh, but maybe you could say a little bit more about your dad and, and how he talked about that. Yeah, he, uh, I would go into these uh, rants and raves, you know, about um, uh, the situation and how bad we had it and uh, uh, really allow uh, what I myself don't like to be overwhelmed by uh, the Islamic Republic. I was overwhelmed by them. Uh, And uh, he would always have a, sort of a smile, uh, a mild smile, and uh, tell me that um, uh, not to look at myself so much as the center of universe (laughs) and not to, um, you know, not to think that uh, I am, whatever happens to me is the best or the worst. And at this point, is the worst. And he uh, would uh, direct me towards history. And uh, I now, uh, remembering him, I do it myself. I think of all the terrible moments Iran has had in in its long ancient history. And uh, I think that uh, this is worse than some and better than others, you know. Uh, So uh, I have, I don't want to lose context. I think that is what he was worried about, that I would lose context. And uh, um, he directed me towards context. There's also something about the form of writing to him. And and it is that epistolary form, that letter writing form. Uh, I've had a little bit of experience with it myself over the last two or three years, writing publicly to people. Uh, And... You know, there was a very famous sports writer in America years ago named Red Smith, who was this superb writer, and and he had this famous off-quoted line: "Writing is easy; you just open a vein." Um, and and there's a way in which I think in these letters, and and I think when we write in that letter form. That's what we do, right? We open a vein. There's something about the form. I'm assuming it's why you chose it over an essay that goes right to the heart. It does, and. Uh You know, it is amazing. Uh, It is not that you know how you want to write. You just have a vague feeling uh, that this is what you want. And the whole process of writing guides you. It tells you uh, what kind of writing is artificial and what kind of writing comes from the heart. And uh, that was the problem I had when I started writing this letter. At first, I was writing letters at random to everybody, actually, including Donald Trump. (laughs) I also wrote to my father, like Saul Bellows Herzog. I was just going nuts writing. But these letters were too random and they wouldn't work. So then I decided to write to the writers whose books I was discussing in my book. But that was so artificial. I had no uh, intimate personal connection uh, to these people. And what was I gonna do? Tell them what their book was about, you know? So uh, then finally I talked to a friend about it and she said, why don't you write to a third person? And almost immediately, my father came to my mind. He was the kind of person to whom I was uh, uh, tied by the strings of my heart, definitely. But at the same time, he was the kind of person with whom I had discussed everything. I had discussed not just my own personal feelings and emotions, but um, uh, ideas, books, people, film, art, music. Uh, So I could discuss all this with him without feeling uh, stilted or without feeling um, as if I was fabricating something. I think it's also when you do this and writing to someone as familiar 
as your father. I mean, what, writing is a lot of things, but one thing it really is fundamentally is choosing words. Uh, and, yeah. and And I think, you know, Orwell talks uh, in politics in the English language about how you can always tell when a government is going to do something abominable uh, because they start using words like transfer of population instead of like, <laughs> refugee crisis or, or rectification of frontiers or elimination of unreliable elements. Uh, you know, Orwell kind of just kneels all these things. And I'm just going to ask you to indulge me. I want to read a poem to you uh, by William Meredith. It's called wow. What I Remember the Writers Telling Me When I Was Young. Uh, Meredith writes, look hard at the world, they said, generously if you can, manage that, but hard. To see the extraordinary data, you have to distance yourself a little, utterly. Learn the right words for the umpteen kinds of trouble that you'll see, avoiding elevated generics like misery, wretchedness, and find yourself a like spectrum of exact terms for joy, some of them archaic, but all useful. Sometimes when they spoke to me, I could feel their own purposes gathering. Language, the dark-haired woman said once, is like watercolor. It blots easily. You've got to know what you're after and get it on quickly. Everything gets watered sooner or later with tears, she said, your own or other people's. The contrasts want to run together and must not be allowed to. They're what you see with. Keep your word hoard dry. So that's William Meredith. And I feel you're doing that in these letters because you can't sort of you can't you can't use obfuscatory language when you're writing to your father. Right. You really have to pick the right words because even though he's not here anymore, somehow he'll know. Yes, exactly. It, it, uh, the way I felt was as if there was this unfinished conversation between us. And uh, I needed to fill in the words. Uh, all, he, all our lives, he told me things he wanted me to know through stories. I felt that now it was my turn to tell him my stories and to tell him things through that, through those stories. That was the only way I could also remind him that I love him, that uh, I have not forgotten him, you know. Uh, if I had forgotten him, then I would have forgotten the language I was I would have used with him, and uh, that language came out of uh, writing. It came out instinctively. So, well, there's a lot of love in this book. There's no question about that, um, and uh, we're lucky to kind of have, have a window <laughs> on it. And that's sort of another way that writing works, I think. We have to take a little break here. We'll have time for one more segment. We have to talk about Margaret Atwood. And I loved that poem. That was beautiful. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, yeah. I, no, I, I knew, I, I thought it was the right poem for you. Uh, but I use it a lot, too. Um, it's uh, So we're talking to Azar Nafisi. The book uh, is Read Dangerously, The Subversive Power of Literature in Troubled Times. Let's take a break, and we'll be back. That's Philippe Jaruski, who I didn't, I didn't, hadn't really discovered. I discovered it. Philippe Jaruski doing research for this show because it turns out Azar Nafisi likes him. Uh, and so now I have like a whole other thing I have to go do. Talk about things that just get into your emotions pretty quickly, though. Uh, so before we come back to Azar, it's time to thank Kat Pastor. She's our wonderful technical producer. Jonathan McPants uh, has done some really inspired producing for this particular show, as he quite often does. Uh, so thanks to both of them. Uh, we'll, we're going to return now to Azar Nafisi, uh, her book, Read Dangerously, The Subversive Power of Literature in Troubled Times. It takes the form of a series of letters to her father, uh, but it's about the work of writers. It's about books, uh, uh, books that have informed her political thinking and, and her thinking about how to live, how to live and su survive in a political environment. So 
You know, Azar, I recently caught a conversation between Margaret Atwood and Ezra Klein on his podcast. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I almost have to go back and listen to it again. Margaret Atwood is a lot like you. I think she's sort of incapable of giving an uninteresting... You could ask her what kind of peanut butter she likes. <laughs> you get like a three-minute really interesting answer about that that went a couple of different places that you weren't expecting. She's she's sort of that way. But I think, you know, the, the letter that you write about her uh, to your father is fascinating. And obviously you're thinking of her and thinking about Gilead, her imaginary republic, uh, so to speak, uh, in two different books. But say more, say more about how Atwood is talking to you. Well, you know, um, you mentioned Atwood. I remembered what he, uh, what she said about the act of writing because mm-hmm. she, she was asked, uh, uh, how do you write? She said, I don't know. There seem to be voices from distant villages beckoning me. There seems to be a bloody cleaver in the middle of the living room. And I say, hmm, what's that cleaver doing there? It needs to be investigated. <laughs> so in many ways for her, uh, as for me, uh, writing is an investigation. It is a coming out of yourself. It is a very Alice-like uh, kind of um, uh, uh, process where um, you let your imagination run after that white rabbit, never asking where the white rabbit is going and does a rabbit talk? How come a rabbit is talking? And you instinctively and without any questions jump down that hole. Uh, You don't ask um, whether I'm going to be uh, safe jumping down this hole, where would this hole lead me? just jump down the hole. That is the curiosity that uh, is behind both the act of writing and reading. And that is what I see in Atwood, uh, that she, um, and uh, she investigates uh, others, but she also puts her heart into it. Uh, I feel very personally uh, personally about Atwood. Right. Well, yes, uh, to your point, I think, you know, r- rabbit holes have gotten a, a bad rap lately. You know, well, rabbit holes are a bad <laughs> place to go. But as you're saying, yeah. they, could, they could be a really good place to go. And when you, when you talk about Atwood investigating and investigating very personally, uh, you know, to me, one of the kind of uh, I don't know, earth shattering uh, aspects of the second book, the more recent book, Testaments, uh, is that she begins to interrogate the character of Aunt Lydia, uh, oh, one of the yes. one of the villains of the book. Uh, I and and I want you to talk about it when. But when I think about it, I think about Milton uh, and Lucifer's famous assertion that the mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell a hell of heaven. Um, Aunt Lydia ultimately decides to kind of try to do both at different times. But but Atwood surprises us by going way inside the rabbit hole of this character who is essentially reviled in the first book. Yes, uh, Aunt Lydia is, I think, the most uh, interesting character in the Testaments. Uh, uh, that whole contradiction which she brings to the fore. I mean, she was a judge before the Republic of Gilead uh, took over, and uh, she is tortured and uh, asked to comply and to work with the regime, and uh, she accepts, but she says that there was this cold other in her who um, said that I'm going to get you for this. And so while she becomes one of the engineers of Gilead, the dystopian uh, land uh, Atwood uh, gives us in Handmaid's Tale and Testaments, while she is one of the engineers that makes makes it work, makes it happen, um, she is also uh, plotting uh, to overthrow it, to destroy it. So how are we going to judge her? What kind of a person is Aunt Lydia? And is she showing us the road to hell or to heaven? These are all the questions that come out uh, in that personality. 
You know, uh, we have, I've used this quote too often but on the show, but we have a little tradition in the family that I'm part of these days that when it's somebody's birthday, uh, the, the mater familias of the family, who's 93 years old, uh, she always asks the same question, no matter who you are and how old you've turned. She says, she always says, what have you learned in the past year? So she, she, <laughs> she asked this uh, of my sort of grandson, Charlie, who's 16, was turning 16. And without even really having to think about it very much, he said, what I've learned is that everybody has a story. Um, and, oh. and that's the Atwood point. It's the John Milton point. It's the, it's the Yazar Nafisi point, right? That whoever that is over there who looks like he's not anything like you oh, and she's doing something pretty terrible, they have stories. I, I'd love you to react. Yeah, they, they, they do. And that is what makes all of us, every single one of us, human beings, as extraordinary. It, it, uh, it, the stories bring out the extraordinariness of the ordinary, you know, and uh, we all have our stories and the stories are a way of really controlling a life that is not controllable. I mean, so many things in life we have no say in. We didn't have a say in coming into the world or choosing the name or the place where we live. And then we live in a place um, like, for example, Kiev uh, right now. And one day uh, the walls of your home um, collapse on your head. So life is fickle. Life is unreliable. Life is not con- is inevitable. It does not allow us to control it. And the fiction does. Fiction gives a view of life that is ours. We control it. We perceive it. And uh, that is um, a great deal of power. You know, and every person does have that story and does have the power to uh, narrate uh, her story. One line in your book, uh, you say, don't you think there is a moment in most political upheavals when people lose their individual voices and become one, where a sort of blindness takes over their faculties and there is a decisive moment that can allow a tyrannical mindset to take over. You know, in 2015, I was at a Trump rally and I saw this happen. I was talking to a whole bunch of people who were there at the rally to cheer for Trump, but he hadn't arrived on stage. And they were actually relatively nice. And each one of them had a story, you know, trying to run yeah. your, we're trying to run my auto body shop and all this stuff is kind of getting in the way of it. Uh, and then they turned into this one voice. It was very scary to watch happen. But what was interesting, I mean, we've just been talking about how we need to be able to imagine the stories of everybody. But there's also a danger of forgetting your own story. I mean, that was almost what they were doing. They were forgetting their own particular story uh, and becoming one voice. That is beautiful. Actually, yeah, they abdicate uh, from themselves. And um, uh, this is one of the seductions of the totalitarian mindset. You know, Uh, we all think that we want to be independent and free. It sounds good to be independent, to be free. As Baldwin reminds us, not many people like to be free or independent. Thinking always has the danger of changing and changing um, is not palatable to all of us. Uh, When we give in to uh, to the mass, when we give in to thousands of other people who like us are shouting and, um, uh, you know, bad mouthing their enemy, uh, we feel safe, we feel secure because we are belong to the army of the good and we are fighting evil, and everything is formulated for us. We don't need to formulate it. We don't need to look at the enemy as another individual like us. We can completely dehumanize. And I've seen that happen to myself when I was a student in the United States, and I was um, part of uh, the Iranian students' movement, how easy it was for me to fall into that trap of demonizing, not just the Shah or the government, but people uh, who were in the movement whom I disagreed with. And uh, I'm very sensitive towards that, uh, to not demonize, uh, to look at everyone, even the ones you most disagree with, 
as uh, individuals, as human beings. Right. If John Milton could write about Lucifer without entirely demonizing a demon, uh, we should be able to do something. Uh, uh, Azar Navisi, we have to stop there. I don't like that we have to stop here, uh, but the show's over. Um, I always love talking to you. That is wonderful. The feeling is quite mutual. I think we've ended in a good place. Azar Navisi's book is Read Dangerously, The Subversive Power of Literature in Troubled Times. I recommend it to you. It will change your attitude and it will make you want to read more books. And that's a good thing, too.